So I'm heading over to the Museum of Flight here in Seattle, and I'm in a lift, as you guys can tell. And I'm with uh, Jamal. What's going on, Jamal? Uh, hi, Joe. <laughs> so, uh, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Afghanistan. Afghanistan, huh? And how long have you been driving for Lyft? Uh, about one year. One year? Yeah. Do you like it? Yes, I like it. Yeah, it's a. Thanks very much. Yes, we'll see you. This is the Caproni CA-20 and it's the world's first fighter plane. And we really did if you read the story right here. Nineteen fourteen, huh? Yep. And the only thing we did to it is put new rubber on the tires. The rest of it's original fabric. Um, what was going on, if you, when you've done, come over here and I'll, I'll show you this. So, <laughs> airplanes in World War I were basically used for reconnaissance. Uh -huh. And uh, they saw each other flying, flying past each other and they said, that's not good. He's taking photos of, photos of my fighting men and they're gonna go give it to the generals to kill them. So, we had to stop them. So the first thing they did is they started throwing bricks at each other. <laughs> and why would they have bricks on a World War One airplane? Right. But you know why would they have it? I mean, basically, they heated Wait. the bricks the night before in the campfires and sat on them to stay warm because they're flying between ten and twenty thousand feet and it's cold. So then they someone brought along a grappling hook and then someone brought a rifle. And most of these planes were two seaters. You had the the cameraman in the back and the pilot. So the guy in the back would shoot at the other guy and then someone put a machine gun on it. And a moving machine gun, it's hard to hit something else that's moving. So Caproni came up with the idea of aiming the entire plane at the, at the enemy. But he couldn't have it low because it'd shoot the propeller off. So he put it above the propeller arc and had a, um, uh, a wire that basically pulled in the cockpit to fire, pull the trigger. They still had to to reload. You still had to he had to stand up in his seat and and swing the gun down and put another magazine on it. So it, it never flew in combat and it never he uh, never had to really do that. But it wasn't a good design. Uh, Volker came up with an interrupter gear that basically was attached to this cam and prevent the trigger from being fired if the, if the blade was right in front of it. It was just a cam action kind of a thing. And he put that mechanism on this airplane right here, the Eindecker, in 1915. You see the gun right behind the propeller, right in eyesight. And this became, they call it the Fokker Scourge because for a whole year, uh, the Germans were shooting down Allied planes like crazy because that was sure. a very accurate way to do it. Um, the, <clears throat> as happens in life, they captured one of these in a crash and saw what he had done and they re-engineered it for their airplanes and so we got synchronized machine guns from that. But um, there were different kinds of machine guns. There's an open bolt and a closed bolt design and the, and the, the uh, open bolt is basically spring-loaded and so the, it didn't work well with synchronization because the spring wears out and it doesn't fire the bullet the same uh, same uh, rhythm or rhythm, yeah, RPM, rhythm. Yeah. yeah. 
So uh, they had, if they had that type of machine gun, they put it on the upper wing like this SC-5A has two types of machine guns. right there that fires through that synchronization mechanism to the propeller but on the top wing if you come back you'll see it has an open bolt one that fires over the top of the so you can see where the other machine gun's located yeah so <laughs> world war one was just uh, you know 1914 when it started it was just uh third or you know 11 years since they invented the first airplane so everything was an experiment. They had uh, single wing planes, double wing planes, and the British tried this, triple wing plane, to see what would happen. It's for the Royal Navy, actually. And uh, as you can imagine, your pilot, basically, what would it do? It, it would basically give you tons of lift, and, uh, and with ailerons on every wing, it would give you a tremendous turning radius. Uh, so, and then the negative would be it's slower because it's got more drag. Mm -hmm. So the Germans saw this plane and later um, invented their famous DR-1 that the Red Baron's famous for. Uh, we have over here in a second. But um, so this was just a grand experiment of airplanes and uh, they were, they didn't have a long shelf life. And, uh, I think the French started with 30,000 airplanes and ended with 3,000 airplanes. Uh, because they didn't last very long, nor did the pilots. So there's a little mechanism that it goes into the cam to, to do the synchronized machine gun, and, and these little rods that come up to the trigger and actually prevent the trigger from being pulled whenever uh, the propeller was right in the middle of it. And here's an interesting story right here. This is an actual World War I plane from the Austrian-Hungarian uh, area. It's called the Avatec. It had a synchronized system, but it had uh, the guns were way back here and it had a long way to go for the, for the bullets to come out. And they had the, the open bolt kind of configuration. So they warned their pilots, they gave them a big tachometer so that they never fired the machine guns be, uh, unless they were between a certain RPM and a certain RPM or they'd shoot the blade off. So can you imagine being in combat and uh, you have to look down at your tachometer and make sure that it's, it's sitting correctly? Right. Pretty, uh, pretty bad duty, but uh, this had a, so most of the engines, and there's a DR-1 from the, now the Germans were very aerodynamically advanced. They actually had these wings stressed so that they didn't even know, need those vertical posts on the end. They were cantilevered inside. And, but it would, it would unnerve the German pilots so much seeing them flapping around that they insisted that they put those structures on it to make them feel more secure. Because it, it, there was no, serious aerodynamic testing back then. They just tried things. So this looks like one of the uh, prettiest airplanes. This is a Albatross, a German Albatross. It was made with plywood instead of fabric on the side. This is what Bar uh, the Red Baron flew most of his missions in. But it had a really annoying habit. Several planes here you'll see have sesquiple plane uh, wings. Bas these are smaller than the top one. But it only had one joint point. So in a steep dive or whatever, uh, they would sometimes lose their wing. They would overstress it, so they put this little brace on it to keep the, wind, the wing from bending. And it sort of worked, but not always. But you'll see the French did it over there on that Newport 27, <coughs> the 24. It has that one connection point, and that was not a good structural uh, connection uh, when you're whipping the plane around the sky. So, um, so this was one of the, it had a Mercedes engine in it, uh, it was one of the good German airplanes, but it wasn't as well liked as some other ones I'll show you because of that fact that, you know, you never knew when your, your wings going to fall off on you. The rotor engines were used great. That was still broken. Okay. Because everything turned. Yeah. And so you had no throttle on them. You had a on-off and a, you had an interrupter switch that would kill the spark in three of the seven cylinders to lower the power. But, and they were, they were lubricated with castor oil and the World War I pilots had scars for a couple of reasons. One, it was cold. One was uh, the castor oil would fall in their face and 
And the other thing is they wrapped it around their mouth because it was a diuretic. It made them go number two. <laughs> and uh, more than one pilot was caught with his pants down trying to take care of things. But they had a good power to weight ratio. And the airplanes were only 7,800 pounds anyway. And so they got a lot of power for them. And so that's why they were used quite a bit. So the, the, the trickiest plane in this bunch was really the sop with camel up there. Uh, they actually designed it to be unstable. The pilot said they needed something that was more responsive. And so you actually, ha I have a, uh, we had a guy come that has, owns one. And he's been, he's, he was able to turn, learn how to turn it to the left and right in the same circumference. And that's hard to do because to go to the right, instead of banking and, and putting your rudder pedal in, uh, if you did that, you go into a spin that you often couldn't recover from. And then to go left, you had to do something different. So um, to go right, how you did it is you push full right rudder and you didn't touch your aileron. To go left, you push full uh, your, your, your stick forward and to the left and push regular aileron and, and regular rudder and you would turn left. So of the 600 and some they, they built, they lost 400 and some in crashes uh, because they were so hard to handle. But if you could perfect it, uh, you were uh, erratic as hell in the air if someone's trying to follow you and shoot you down, when you turn, you turn like nothing else in the sky. Right. And, and it became, uh, in the hands of a skilled pilot, became an asset. But uh, they purposely developed it to be unstable and, and to do that, but in the process forgot to teach the pilots how to fly. Because remember in the French uh, flying uh, schools, the, the instructor didn't go up with you. He stayed on the ground. Hmm. So they gave you an airplane that had little wings on it that wouldn't actually fly and you'd race it up and down the airport. And then as you got better at that, they would tell you the theory of landing and give you one with wings on it and send you on your way. So um, the, the soldiers in the trenches that looked up and saw everyone flying and having a wonderful time didn't realize that the average World War I pilot had a three week lifespan. Uh, either accidents got you, which is the, most, the thing that most got them, or, you know, they didn't have parachutes. Uh, if they got shot down, the gas tank usually blew. Uh, so you carried, a, you carried your pistol for it uh, along for, for the long ride down because the, the dope on the wings were burning. And so uh, you put yourself out of your misery because you didn't want to wait. Yourself. Yeah, you shoot yourself. Well, it sounded like a rough uh, yeah. way to combat. Yeah, it did. And it didn't, in truth, it didn't make a difference in World War I. The, the photographs helped the generals, but they, did, they didn't learn from it. They kept runch, uh, 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 racing from trench to trench, and, mm. and, and that slaughter ensued. There's a movie out, uh, and we just saw it. In fact, Cal and I just saw it. It was uh, uh, They Shall Not Grow Old, and it's about World War I soldiers, and mm. it's pretty amazing. If you can see it <coughs> somewhere, it's, it's worth seeing. Can you talk about the Lafayette Escadrille a little well, bit? That, there were only, that was an American group that went over prior to our involvement, and there were only 35 pilots. It was a very small force, and they flew for the French. It was sort of like the American Volunteer Group in World War II, the Flying Tigers. Same idea. Uh, we didn't have a lot of pilots uh, in, in going into this thing, uh, but they flew the French planes, uh, were, were uh, stationed with the French uh, aviators, and, and started combat before we got there. Okay. That's kind of the short story of what they did. Yeah, but uh, they were they were they were famous because they were the volunteers and they were the ones to uh, to start in combat first. This uh, this summer I flew one of the grandsons. Oh, how I, I cool. don't know his last name, but uh, Nick. If you watch this, Nick, you'll know who I'm talking about. But okay. um, Nick is a I believe a F-15 fighter pilot oh, in the cool. Air Force. Wow. But his grandfather was one of the Lafayettes. One so, of the 35. Yeah, it's that's pretty great impressive. Grandfathers, I think, but that's pretty impressive. Um, so this is what Newport this 28. Is 28. Now this yep. is what the French gave us because they didn't like it. Um, Looks like Newports, it would fly good. They had. We have two other Newports over there. They were fine airplanes. This was a good airplane, but they had production problems. They had the uh, Eddie Rickenbacker, our top ace, with 26 victories, flew this initially, and and basically found out the hard way that, about losing your laundry. They had the seam for the top on the fabric on the top wing right on the edge. And then in, in steep dives, it would depart. And he lost all of his fabric basically in this top wing and suddenly you have no lift. Wow. So that happened to him a couple times and he was able to land safely finally. And then um, the plane itself was fine. 
but it was the quality control of, of, of mm -hmm. uh, the manufacturer that was a problem with it. But the French nevertheless made them and then gave them to us and, and then later on we, we got the SPAD and they got the SPAD and this is their best airplane of the war. If the DR-7 was the German, the, the DR-7 was the best plane of the war, fighter plane, any side. In fact, as the armistice, the, the Germans, uh, that plane up there had to basically, you can walk over here and see it better, uh, basically had to surrender them to us so we could study them. But, and I can't tell you what made it so good. It was a combination of the right engine, the right design, the good weight. Uh, the Germans had uh, even did things like uh, their wiring was flat, so that it was turned to the wind, so it wouldn't wouldn't create uh, wouldn't be round wires, or they'd eliminate them altogether. But uh, the Germans just had a good aeronautical knowledge. In fact, they were the ones that came up with the DR-8, which we have hanging over the staircase. And this shows the wing structure of the DR-8. They found out that a fat, fatter wing actually creates more lift, and so uh, they started just having a monoplane. Hmm. And at the tail end of the war, they had invented a, a practical parachute for their for their pilots. The early parachutes were so heavy that planes couldn't take them, and so no one had them. But uh, basically, this was what the everyone why everyone wanted to be pilots because living in the trenches was awful, and it wasn't this nice. <laughs> so this is a mock up or a mock up of a trench of wow. how you would live, and then you, the captain would blow his whistle, and you'd go over and run right into machine gun fire. You know, actually, what's funny is they walked right into machine gun fire. They didn't even run. <clears throat> it was old kinda, world thinking. Kind of Civil War type. It was almost. Well, the Germ generals were one behind. I mean, they hadn't. Uh, they didn't catch up to the fact the machine gun could kill so many people, and and that's what it became a slaughter. Man. In this movie I just saw, they they had one uh, regiment to start with 600 men, and and 100 men came back from one charge. That was it. Have you ever seen the movie Blue Max? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's a great movie. You guys need to watch Blue Max if you have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's... But wow. you're right, the DR-7 was still the best airplane of, of the war. You were talking about the Barnstormers. The old JN-4 Jenny. Yeah, this is what they, and we left the fabric <laughs> off to show people what it looked like in reality. Uh, at the end of World War I, you could buy one of these for $500 and the engine for 50 And this is what Charles Lindbergh and others taught themselves to fly on and did the barnstorming around the cent you know, the, all the farms in mid-America and the like. But um, it had the OX-5 engine. Uh, they found out by stopping and starting so much between flights, the, it, it actually the crankshaft would, would bend over time. And so it, the engines weren't really reliable for that use because the metallurgy was not up to snuff. Uh, so you'd have to you'd have engine failures on them from time to time because of that. But um, you know, this was a, we made 10,000 of these to train our pilots for World War One, and none went overseas. So we had a, a guest like yourself come through one time, and he was uh, a surgeon. Is he's retired now, but he made gave us down search you'll see one of every airplane that flew in World War II models that he made on his, between surgeries and at night and so we commissioned him afterwards to make one of every plane that flew in World War I. These are all to the same scale of each other, 148. So look at his work. I mean, wouldn't you like to have him operate on you? Look at the detail of that. It's just amazing. And I'll show you the guy you didn't want to be in this one right over here. The French never flew it for themselves. This is a it's bad, but it, this is before they had synchronized <laughs> machine guns. They put a guy up front in front of the propeller. So the French sold this to the Russians, and the Russians just mounted the, the, the gun fixed because no idiot would want to ride there. Uh, what could possibly go wrong, right? So that's a SPAD A2, huh? Yeah. Never even heard of one. Right, right. But if you look at a number, you can look on the computer and tell what every airplane is here. So the surgeon made all these for you guys yep and he made them by hand they're not kits it would take him uh once he researched the the markings and stuff it would take him a couple days to make each one and then he brought them out here from baltimore each one in its own styrofoam case the, the detail the detail and then what's what's really cool is this this is to the same scale as those 148 this is the zeppelin that would bomb london 
And here's the, you can see the little man right there. So our guy, Sam, uh, one of our docents made the balloon and uh, envelope and he made, uh, he made the gondolas with the people in them and all that. Let's, let's get some light on it. That's really unbelievable. You can see inside there's maps and there's there's guns and uh, it's just amazing. But these, this thing would bomb, you see a guy going up the stairs right here? This would bomb London from 20,000 feet. And of course it's filled with hydrogen. So the, the British would come up with incendiary bullets to try and shoot it down. But one of the things that was interesting is that it was hard to catch them on fire because a bullet would go through into the, the bag full of hydrogen, but there was no oxygen. And you need this, you know, you, you need oxygen to have Plus the they're up so high, there's less oxygen, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, all that stuff. So, you know. Um, so, uh, this was but not good duty. It was cold. They did give them parachutes, and it was kind of ineffective, but uh, the Germans did do that. And that's an actual World War I airplane as well. That's a FAS. So, if you were a good German pilot, you knew you were because they'd give you a DR-7, and if you were a second tier, this is what they would give you. So you could tell which squadrons were which by the type of airplanes that they flew. Man. This was still a good airplane of, of the day but uh, the DR-7 was the best. Mm -hmm. And then this is the DR-8 with the single wing that you saw crash. This, is, this came out at the very end of the war, but they were experimenting with monoplanes. Boy, it's an awesome collection. It is. It is. Let's go see World War II.